Good evening. Welcome to another episode of The Four Elements. Tonight we have a very exciting show. Uh, tonight we'll, we will be discussing uh, grief and uh, healing grief through ritual with a special guest, Dr. Maladoma Somme. So Dr. Maladoma Somme is an initiated uh, Dagra elder. Uh, he is a renowned lecturer and author, tra- author tra- traveling the world, uh, teaching the Dagra culture and spiritual technology. Uh, he's authored uh, three books thus far. Those books are The Healing Wisdom of Africa, Ritual, Power, Healing, and Community, and Of Water in the Spirit. ...to see that we live in a world in which... Um, some some of us who come here as the healer of our family, the healer of our community, are more or less the least acknowledged uh, within the uh, larger community, and yet they're holding a very, very important gate of the human wellness. Um, should these people be able to come together, uh, it will definitely make them feel better, you know. And uh, this is the kind of thing I hope for. This is the kind of thing I wish for for them that uh, the day come when it is possible for them to meet up with like likeness, uh, like mindedness, in order to be able to feel uh, supported. If anything, supporting each other in this process, in this kind of unrewarding job, has its reward in it. You know. So uh, I don't know how how uh, how much more to say about it. All I can all I can see is the need to acknowledge the fact that uh, there are more and more people like that who are the holder, the keeper of the grief of the collective. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, so um, oh, Elder boy. Melodoma, you mentioned mm-hmm. that. In doing, if someone wants to wants to just begin the process of of mm-hmm. grief from a from a ritual perspective, something simple that they can do, you mentioned mm-hmm. for them to include their ancestors. And there are many people who hear that term and may not know how to do that. So, how would someone include their ancestors in their grief? That's the point. Um, oh boy. The basic, the basic thing we all call to do uh, is to establish a sacred corner somewhere in our dwelling place dedicated to the ancestors. Uh, we call that a shrine. Uh, it's a sacred space. It's a, it's, it's a place where we know that when we go there, at least we, we are surrounded by our ancestors. Now, including the ancestors is an act of imagination and creativity of the type that uh, has contemplative values associated with it. That means that you got to be able to feel and to to imagine yourself surrounded by the the dead that are associated with you. Uh, and this is just a personal effort that one has to make. It's not because you don't see them that they're not there. Our visual apparatus is limited. And so consequently, can we therefore transcend our visual to that place where we can see with our body, see with our, our heart and our soul? And if that is possible, because this is not the kind of thing you can teach somebody, uh, but if it is possible to imagine something like this, then you can feel being surrounded by your ancestors. And by ancestors, I simply mean the dead people in your family tree, the one that have already crossed over, and uh, who we may consider gone, but who are there without a body and nonetheless alive and well. So these are the ones that we must surround ourselves with. These are the ones we must be willing to talk to at the risk of being labeled some kind of crazy person. But we really know, have to know that the real path of healing could, uh, uh, could translate in the eyes of other people as us being rather crazy uh, in, 
this day and, and, and age, it is an important radical step that we need to take to cross the boundaries of um, alignments and uh, 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 you know decorum uh, to that place where eccentricity is more visible than fellowship, than, you know, acting in the in the expected way so that people don't label us one way or another. And so this is something that is easier done in the privacy of your own uh, space than in public. And this is why when this comes out in community, it needs to be in sacred space where everyone is expected to be a bit eccentric, that is to say, moving away from the norm, from the expected, from the social norm, that is. So, uh, uh, indeed, in practical thinking, this shrine allowed the person to sit in front of it and to imagine himself or herself surrounded by the ancestors and to act accordingly. And so, above and beyond that, it will take some uh, 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 some uh, radical radical teaching initiative to get someone to be in that mode in that frequencies and that is uh, 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 much harder than one can imagine and yet it is possible for each person to be able to imagine you know uh, to feel the presence of the other the invisible other. Uh, and uh, this is what I was suggesting in um, in in my earlier uh, uh, proposal that uh, those who cannot have uh, access to a uh, public grief ritual be able at least uh, to prep themselves to wet the ground of their own emotion uh, using this particular model. Call it with the last four digits eight eight two three. Uh, state your name and your comment or question, please. Um, my name is Quintress, and my question is, if grief um, or some form of grief is passed on through um, from generation to generation, when you do a grief ritual, is um, mm-hmm. once you get down to the core of it or once you peel all of the layers back, um, mm-hmm. will some of that grief be eradicated or is that something that's always going to be with you? That's a very good question. Uh, there is an, an idea that uh, in every family there is a there's a well of grief that is shared. Um, grief, as such, is not just therefore uh, a private individual uh, property, and this is the reason why it's they say that uh, emotion uh, is like something that belongs to the collective. So in uh, Dagra culture, there are people who are considered the vessel of grief. They're the one with the capacity to stir grief out of people who do have difficulty getting into it by themselves. They don't certainly uh, go to the person and uh, instruct them on how to feel. They just they just show grief. They just demonstrate grief. They just grief. Period. Um, and so, therefore, it is possible that a person. And so, therefore, it is possible that uh, this. Uh, this is a specialty into itself. Uh, you carry the grief of the collective, and therefore it is not necessarily that your own grief uh, is still pending. It's that there is a well of grief that is village-like, that is family-like, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, this is the reason why it's hard to say that once you have grieved something, it is over. Uh, The example I was giving earlier uh, of uh, the death of my aunt, uh, that uh, I I had to uh, organize the funeral, and during the course of which I found out that uh, uh, I was being reminded of all the losses that I've experienced in the past 40 years, or even 50 years, and... uh, 
realizing in the end that uh, her death was a gift to me to remember all of this and to grieve that all over again. So consequently, it's not about getting rid of something and moving on to the next and so forth. It's about transmuting. It's about uh, uh, transforming all of that which has been holding you down sufficiently so you become more like a fluid person, like a river flowing in the direction of least resistance towards the home of your belonging. And so in that case, the journey itself is the destination. And so uh, we cannot look at this from this uh, beginning, middle, and end. Otherwise, we'll end up saying, uh, it's saying about some people that they don't have any grief to express, which is not true. It can never be true. As long as the world still face, faces big issues, somehow the grief associated with that uh, has some extension within us. So that's, this is uh, part of the reason why it is more important to puncture this barrier that separates us from grief than to think that we can, we can fulfill grief, we can deal with grief and put it behind us so that we can live happily ever after. The thing about grief is that the more you grieve, the more joy you have in your life. Uh, joy is a measure of the depths of grief. Otherwise, joy has a level of artificiality that, uh, in the end, uh, may not be all that fully satisfactory to the person. Um, I believe also, if I still remember uh, the nature of the question that was asked, that uh, uh, at this juncture, uh, we're being asked to uh, check the frequencies of our heart to see how much of this type of emotion we possess. And if we have it so much to the point where we can grieve without even knowing what we're grieving about, most likely we are grieving for the collective. We are grieving perhaps for those who cannot grieve. And that is equally important than to think that you can take care of your own grief and get it done uh, ahead of a lot of other people, et cetera, et cetera. Be happy to. So, um, you know, Elder Maladoma, we have been having these conversations lately about grief and ritual, particularly around the what what I've come to use the term healing the wounded African soul, and that those conversations were more or less motivated by looking at many of the things that have been happening in our um, African diaspora community, particularly in, in, in America. Um, we've had so many, so many griefs, so many tragedies that have happened, and it's bringing out, it has brought out so much anger and so much frustration and so much pain within the hearts of, 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 of the Africans in America. And so we've been having this conversation about, you know, how, what we can do to kind of begin the healing process, not that it hasn't begun before, but we can do to heal. And I was just looking at your own journey from your book of Water and the Spirit, which is pretty much, I guess, your autobiography. And I witnessed, and we were, we were, we've been given a glimpse into your world, so I witnessed that you also experienced loss starting from a very mm-hmm. early age when your grandfather passed to mm-hmm. going through and being taken from your, from your family and being taken from your tribe and being, you know, brought up in a very strict and abusive environment. So you have some personal experiences with, with grief and loss. Would you mind sharing what, how that has impacted you and how you have managed to come to a place of wholeness and reconciliation? Mm. Well, thank you for this question. Uh, but first of all, I would like to um, stress the point that um, uh, losses are only the the uh, most visible and starting points or starting elements that invite grief. In other words, that uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, pay attention to the fact that every time grief is felt, uh, that is 
simply because uh, s- something that contradicts our basic sense of humanity, something that uh, brings us to the threshold, uh, has been made so visible that uh, uh, we need uh, to pause and pay attention to the message therein. Uh, for me, of course, that thing begun uh, at the very early early stages of my life uh, was the first most uh, important thing that had to do with uh, being uh, separated from uh, the roots, uh, separated from the uh, cradle of my belonging. And so I realized that... Uh, On hindsight, anyone that uh, has had to be uh, um, forced away from a sense of belonging and a sense of identity, that person automatically signs up for a sacred expression of loss or of, call it, uh, injustice or a, anything that might be a direct response to the crisis of the soul as a result of the, drama, the dramatic event that happened. So for me, it was not just a separation from, uh, from the cradle of my belonging, but it was also the uh, kind of uh, reality that, was, that were forcefully uh, imposed upon me. Um, Indeed, uh, an education or an introduction to a reality, uh, to a worldview that has nothing to do with that which your soul and your spirit is naturally tuned in by birth can translate into one form of trauma or another which endless vented through the agency of grief can translate into something much worse. I've had to deal with that myself directly as I grew up in a boarding school, a Catholic boarding school, where I was taught everything but the very thing that uh, was uh, essentially part of my identity, something that was supposed to honor my identity. So I imagine, again, that uh, this is not to be considered an isolated case, that on on the grand scheme of things, so many of us who today are in the diaspora uh, can indeed find ways to relate uh, to this situation, and can indeed, uh, in broadening the imagination, uh, realize very quickly how that has impacted the path of their lives in terms of its quality uh, and uh, the kind of challenges that it paused to the delivery of their gifts and the fulfillment of their purpose. So I've reached a stage of my life where I, d- I no longer see my own itinerary as a personal thing, but more as a collective, as one that is mirrored by so many other people that it should become uh, one of the biggest subject of conversation, uh, uh, the subject that allows us to look at ways to address this issue, not really solely intellectually, uh, but a reflection that can guide us into some sacred space we're in. because you spoke about uh, loss. And many people feel as if, well, that was, you know, we've lost so much for so many years. You know, it's kind of time to get over it right now. So what, what do we need to come together and grieve for? You know, it's just like the world is it, what it is. How, how would you speak to that about what it means to step into that threshold, into that doorway of grief? What is it that we're, we need to grieve about? What is it we need to bring to the table? Well, it's just about everything. 
um, the loss of identity, the loss of connectivity, uh, loss in general is the lot of the diaspora. That is the reason why it earned the name diaspora. The issue is more about not so much dwelling in this kind of uh, approach that, you know, what is done is done, and we have to get over it, uh, stiffen up, and uh, show yourself as a grown-up person, as if somehow being grown-up means uh, being repulsed by any kind of uh, expression of grief. Furthermore, the whole idea of grief must be uh, must be also checked uh, within the light of uh, the um, the idea of expressing emotion, particularly that part of emotion that is complete with tears and uh, with wailing and so on and so forth. That. Uh, Modernity tends to look at as a sign of weakness or, in best case scenario, vulnerability. Uh, my sense is that uh, far from worrying whether we have something to grieve about, it is more about uh, uh, thinking in terms of what more do we lose by refusing to grieve. What is wow. it that we end up doing that is actually collaborating with the status quo when we choose to shy away from grief and therefore mm-hmm. approach our our lives solely from the standpoint of politic, society, civil right, you name it, when we mm. know that uh, the reclaiming of our authenticity uh, must first begin with a very hard look at the self and where we came from in order to be able to know where we're going. And so as a result, what kind of original initiative can we take and an initiative that does not have a precedent and it's solid enough that it touches on all the departments of the human consciousness. And this is when grief shows up as an extremely sacred thing. For another Charlotte Post, uh, the next show. And in closing, um, I would like to give Elder uh, Maladoma an opportunity to say any closing remarks. Well, we are at a, at a really critical uh, juncture of our evolution, and we need to uh, uh, to understand that um, uh, there are duties associated with that. That that the, our ancestors are calling for the best in us, the gift in us, to become more explicitly shown in the world. One must always ask oneself the question. Uh, how much am I showing, am I bringing my gift, am I sharing that gift that was given to me to bring to this world and to make available to others so that I can position myself as a recipient of their own gift? It is important that uh, we understand that we are not a random occurrence in this world and uh, the reason why we speak about grief has a lot to do with that, that we are here placed at this time and space in order to make our medicine shine, to rise into the plate of our responsibilities and to join hand together when the going gets tough so that together we can make the going a lot easier. And so in that process... We always need to call constantly on our ancestors to show us the way, to guide us, and in the process, show a great deal of positive uh, posture, 
thinking attitude in front of the darkest challenge and adversity that may present itself to us, knowing that as long as we are surrounded by our ancestors, we're never alone. And it is in, in this context that we need to grieve together, to come together in order to uh, remember our emotional self, that we are vessels of emotion, and that emotion heals. And therefore, let's look forward. Uh, let's, let's, let's look forward to that and really reach out to our ancestor to make that happen to all of us. Ashe. Ashe, Ashe. 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 Mm-hmm. I'm so grateful mm-hmm. that you were able to join us uh, yeah, this evening, likewise. Elder Maladoma. Yeah, enjoyed likewise. deeply the conversation. Mm-hmm. And uh, we look forward to having you again. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, well, I know oh. that you've been on the show before. I look forward yeah. to having you again. Yeah, I look more, to more healing yes. wisdom of Africa. That's Thank right. you so much. Thank you. And uh, good night. Thank you, Elder Maladoma. Have a good night.